All right. Hi, everyone. This is Class 8 for Recording Studio Fundamentals, Spring 2022, Copeland School of Music. And how is everybody doing today? Great. So we're a little light, uh, unfortunately. Um, some people are starting to fall behind, which is sad, but it's the way it is. Okay, so uh, we're going to be full-on moving into audio work today. We started last week with the editing assignment, and then now we're going to continue on with a few more other things, and there'll be an assignment where we're going to start learning how to mix a little bit uh, audio, and I have in our class OneDrive class 8 there are these stems and I'll show you how to import them and then also this the material for today's class is up in here Uh, are there any questions about audio editing that you have before we get started with today? No. Nope. Uh, I didn't think it was a difficult, you know, it's, it's, it, it, I didn't think it was a difficult assignment, but I don't really want to give a difficult assignment at first. I want you to just understand the basic principles. You know, when I first started editing audio, which was over 20 years ago, it was in the function of, and I'm not sure whether I mentioned this last week or not, creating library music, basically production music, and then having to create 60 second, 30 second, and all that stuff. And I didn't have anybody to show me. There wasn't the internet back then. And, you know, I even went to an engineer and had him show me how to edit, but it just... It just didn't, it didn't work really. It took me years to learn how to edit audio and do a good, literally, if I said three or four years, and not, not that I was editing audio every day, but I was editing audio often. And it took me a long time to learn how to you, do it. And it wasn't until I had the bright idea one day of taking audio and putting it into the work session so that I had all the tempo, like if I made a mix of something, I import it back into the session so that I had it lined up with, if I had tempo changes where all the different sections were and I, and I learned how to use the, uh, uh, the shuffle mode. It wasn't until I got understood how to do that that I really started learning. It started to become easier for me. And then once I started doing that, it sort of all kind of fell into place. And editing audio is a really essential skill because there'll come times where you have to edit audio. And if you don't know how to do it, you have to give it to somebody else. It'll cost you money. It'll take you time. And it's, it's a very valuable skill to have. You can really, um, you can really uh, take multiple takes and edit them together to create a, a whole that sounds really good. There's this famous story that they were recording the song Strawberry Fields and they had two different versions and John Lennon liked the first half of one version and the second half of another version except that they were at different tempos and in different keys. And he said, well, you guys just figure it out. And they had to sort of figure it out by getting changing the speed of the tape recorder to get the pitches to match. And then if you listen to the song, it's not in the key of A and it's not in the key of B flat. It's sort of somewhere in between. And that's part of the reason why, because they were changing the speed of the tape recorder, which would change the, the pitch of the music. And, you know, back then they did it with a razor blade on magnetic tape. Well, those were, you know... In, in really interesting interesting skills that these guys had. And I've been present where I've watched an engineer take a two-inch, 24-track tape, master tape, and edit together two different takes. And that that's really, uh, 
that takes some real skill. I, that's not something I could do because I don't have experience editing tape, not, none at all. Um, I have experience recording the tape, but not editing tape. Yeah. So, all right, let's move forward and continue on with audio. And we'll, we're going to have a, a discussion about audio at the beginning of each class. I also have two or three more people that I want to talk about in terms of using the recording studio as a compositional tool. I want to skip a week this week because I have a lot of material that I want to get through today. And I'll get back to that next week. Probably it'll take two weeks to finish. Uh, I want to do a guy named uh, uh, Joe Meek and I want to do a guy named uh, Tom Dowd. And then there's a reggae guy that I want to do um, who's really amazing. So, yeah, the guy from Jamaica. So that's that's what I want to do uh, over the next few weeks in terms of that. But let's switch our focus now into talking about audio. And here we go. And I do have material. This material is available for you to uh, have. All right, so everybody knows that sound are, are made up of waves, right? And NASA has a really cool presentation, which I think will really be helpful for everybody. They, they do it really well and better than I can. Okay, where did it go? Let's get this so that it's really big. So they've got this up on, on the NASA website, and they're talking about understanding sound waves and the sonic booms, right? So they, they're doing something where they use technology to quiet the sound of sonic booms down by uh, the Cape Canaveral or whatever they call it these days, the Kennedy Space Center. So the physics of waves, right? This is beyond what I teach in this class. If you want to know more about this, uh, the science department offers physics of sound, which is a really good class. They've been actually offering it since I was an undergraduate in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. So waves are created when energy is transferred through a medium like water or air. There are two types of waves, transverse and longitudinal sometimes called pressure or compression waves. When people think of, think of waves, they also think of transverse waves. So let's talk, uh, we'll watch the videos and we'll see an ex example and explanation of these different waves. So this is longitudinal waves. Here we go. All right, so you see there that oh, you could see how a wave moves. That's a longitudinal wave, so it moves from left to right or from right to left. Um, and you could see how there's just the compression and the expansion. So that's one is where the, the, the wave is really bunched up. And you could see that if you look at the ocean. It's very simple. And then the other part is where there, it's, it's after that peak point there where things get spread out a little bit. So that's the thing to, to get from there. And then here we go with transverse waves.
So it moves perpendicular to the direction of the wave, right? So this is really important right here. I'm going to stop this. Uh, let me turn. Right. So if you imagine, imagine a line that goes straight through here from here to here. The trough is the lowest point away from that middle line and the crest is the highest point. And one complete cycle is the distance from here to here or from a crest to to another crest. It, it just, you know, everybody measures it a little differently. I like to measure it from the zero where it crosses at zero, and I'll talk about that shortly. It's just easier for me to see where that is. So that's called the wavelength. The amplitude is the measurement from the, what they're calling the baseline to here or from here down to here. That's the volume. So if this went up like this, that would be a louder sound because the distance from here up to this imaginary point that I just drew here is greater. The number of these cycles, see this is why I like to do from zero, if we Think of the baseline as zero, as in no volume. Um, you can see where that crosses the line. So if you go from here all the way over to here, that's one wavelength, right? And the number of wavelengths per second or how frequently you complete a cycle in a second is the pitch. It's the frequency, okay? All right, so that's just basically about the, the amplitude. Sound waves are longitudinal waves that travel through a medium like air or water. When we think about sound, we often think about how loud it is, amplitude or intensity, and its pitch frequency. So how frequently it, it does its wave, uh, complete wave form, wavelength. Uh, don't worry about the X-59. I want to point out an error here, and we'll talk about this when we talk about microphones. Okay, so they've got a, a kid playing an electric guitar here, right? And they're showing that it, it this should real if this was more if this was an acoustic guitar, this would be more accurate. Yes, an electric guitar does this, but the way that most people hear an electric guitar is that they've got these things on them called pickups. pickups, these, these things here, right? These are microphones on your guitar. And um, yeah, they pick up the vibration of the string and it, 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 through electronics, it comes out here and you plug it into a guitar amp and it makes sound that you can really hear. But an electric guitar is actually very soft and, and that's not the typical way that you hear an electric guitar through with this, if this is an acoustic guitar, it'd be much more accurate. <laughs> Sorry, NASA, I have to critique you. 
but I am not a rocket scientist. All right, so what are the parts of a sound wave? So let's take a look at this. This is pretty cool. So humans have a normal he hearing range between 20 and 20,000 hertz, which is different from many other animals. Now, as you get older, you hear softer, uh, low, lower frequencies or high frequency uh, goes, right? So at my age, I can probably hear up to, on a good day, 14,000 when I was younger, I had very good high pitch frequency hearing, but even though I wear earplugs, uh, thirty-five years of playing in loud pit orchestras has done, and and age has lowered my high frequency. I still have good hearing for my age, but not as good as you guys, right? It, uh, you know, your ears are younger and fresher, and so you can hear higher frequencies. And it's funny because I've done this in class where I've played. Um, a high frequency sine wave that I can barely hear. And I've got some students doing this, right? You know, cause it's hurting there, uh, when I, in, in person classes. So that's one thing you have to remember about humans. Okay. So dogs and cats, right? So this is the elephants, moles. They hear these really low pitched sounds. And we hear from about 20, so we don't hear all the way down to zero. Uh, and then we hear up to 20,000 uh, when we have perfect, our, our ears are in perfect shape. Dogs can hear almost as low as we can, but they can hear twice, dogs and cats can hear twice as high frequencies. So they hear stuff that like, you know, like if you, that thing about a dog whistle, it's true. You know, and that's why um, dogs Dogs and, and cats, but I have most experience with dogs, they can, some of them can get very disturbed by loud noises, explosions, firecrackers, gunfire, um, because they hear it so much louder than we do, right? And so, you know, it's, my dog is, uh, gets, is, when we have a thunderstorm, or it's 4th of July, oh, it's like misery for her. So, it's because they hear it so, so loud. Now, look at this. A bat and a dolphin can hear up to 160,000 vibrations per second, which is insane. And the other thing, too, is that we measure the frequency of sound waves in a unit called hertz. So, if you hear somebody saying 440 hertz, which is A, that means there are 440 vibrations per second, 440 complete wavelengths in a second. So in our PDF, there's a link to that. So let's take a look at this, right? So we'll talk with something called a sine wave. And this is, this is how we look at, as musicians, right? They were showing that bit with the... With the uh, with the perpendicular lines to make their point. But we're going to, this is how we as musicians look at waves. Okay. Let's make this uh, fill up the screen here. 
So this is a sine wave. A sine wave is the basis of every sound you hear. Every sound you hear is comprised of multiple sound uh, sine waves at different frequencies from the fundamental pitch. I'll explain that in a, a I explained that remember when I went over the organ registrations and I showed how you could play one note and you could be hearing a triad, right? That's all, all those different pitches are made up of sine waves. And what you know, when you listen to so, s instruments that have very complex waveforms with lots of overtones like a bassoon and oboe, uh, uh, things like that, um, you'll see that they've got insane amounts of, of frequencies above the fundamental pitch. And some of them even have frequencies below the fundamental pitch, undertones. Um, those are all, in theory, sine waves that are all stacked on top of each other. And we hear them as one contiguous unit. In theory. All right. So this break point across here, right? That's our reference point. So a cycle can be from the peak to the peak, right? Or from the, the peak down here to the peak down here. So this zero line is volume. So every time it crosses this zero line, there is absolutely no volume. This is the peak of the volume, and this is the other peak of the volume on the flip side of the wave. The reason why we don't hear that there's no volume every time it crosses by here is that these things are happening so fast. It gives you the illusion that it's a continuous tone. Right, because our ears can't discern every time it passes by the zero point. Now, it's easier for me to go from zero to zero because that's an absolute thing that's easy to see for the cycle. So remember, the distance from here up to here, that's volume. And this volume up here is equal to this volume down here. That's just the flip side of it all. And what this is represented in life is if we watch a speaker, right? Like a, a speaker uh, on a, on, on your, if you've got a stereo unit with speakers or a speaker on your phone, or if you play an amplified instrument, the speaker that you've got, right? Speakers vibrate and they vibrate in and out. And the out is one side is one side of that and the in is the other side. So this is a video and it's in slow motion and we could take a look at a speaker vibrating. So you could see that going in and out, and you could see all sorts of stuff that it actually moves with the music, the speaker, in rhythm, right? So that's, um, and it, sometimes it, it vibrates, it seems to contract and expand more uh, deeper than other times. Well, that's because it's louder, you know, and it's causing, and, and also it's, right? You hear that kick drum. And it's lower frequency as well. And because it's that's a complex waveform, it's not doing this. It's it's doing all sorts of different complex oscillations. If we were to play a sine wave through there that was very and slow it down like this, we'd see a more even in and out of the speaker. All right. And that's pushing air. Right, and it's pushing these waves out, it's disturbing the air, and that air comes and it gets in, and our ears are like reverse speakers; they're microphones on our heads.
Okay, so a sine wave is is defined as a curve representing periodic oscillations of constant amplitude. Periodic oscillations of constant amplitude. That means there is a period, right, you know, of an amount of time, regular amount of time that it oscillates, that that's what those speakers were doing. They were oscillating in and out of constant amplitude. So that's a constant volume, right? So you could see that the volume for each one of these oscillations or these cycles is the same and that the distance between each one of these is the same. All right. That's what periodic oscillations of constant amplitude means in English <laughs> as opposed to rocket science. And this is given by a sine function. So that's trigonometry. Uh, I never took trigonometry. Um, I did have to take math in college, but not trigonometry. So sine waves are described as pure tones because they represent a consistent single oscillations. And I would add that they've got no overtones, although it's very hard to find a sine, sine wave with no overtones. All sounds in nature are fundamentally constructed of sine waves. More complex sounds simply contain more oscillations at different frequencies, right? So they, they stack waveforms that are happening at the same time on top of each other, and they make very complex waveforms, which I'll show you shortly. The higher frequency oscillations, which are tonally related to the fundamental frequency, are known as harmonics. And we went over that with the organ, right? You know, the, th the fifth, an octave and a fifth above, two octaves and a third above, and the, you know, and, and one octave above, all that stuff. All sounds in nature produce harmonics simply because the physics of air and other materials create simultaneous tones in higher octaves. Uh, next week, I'm going to play a video by Leonard Bernstein, which is an amazing... Um, it's, it's just an amazing explanation of the overtone series and how the entire history of Western music developed because of the overtone series. It's really great. All right, so this is a complex waveform, right? You could see that, and we're going to look at this inside of, the, inside of Pro Tools. You could see that it's not regular. There's varying amplitudes. There's, you know, there's different waves. I mean, we're going to zoom in on this and it's going to be, it's not a great resolution, but you could see that there's all sorts of different stuff going on there. This, this, this part is louder than this part. This is quiet right here. This is a quieter section and then it gets louder again and then it fades down to nothing, right? So you could look at that and see all those different, and this is the time that it is. It starts here and ends here. Volume. Up and down is volume. Left to right is time. And so if we were to zoom in on that, right, we would see a more complex waveform. And in this case, one cycle is from this peak to this peak if everything was one stayed at the same pitch. All right. Even though it crosses this, this zero line, Multiple times, we're going from crest, you know, from peak to peak. Or it could be from here to here. Same thing. Same way of measuring. It's the same amount of time. The amount of time from here to here, if this is one, one pitch with all, these over, with all these tones happening simultaneously, this is the same amount of time as this would be. Okay, that's the end of that. All right, so we're going to talk now about synthesizer waveform types. All right, and I have a demonstration plan for you. Very shortly. <laughs> uh, so there is... There's multiple kinds of synthesis, right? The organ is the earliest, one of the earliest types of synthesis. Actually, you could say it's the earliest because there were pipe organs hundreds and hundreds of years ago, right? That's called additive synthesis, where you're adding tones on top of each, on top of a fundamental to create an aggregate pitch color, right? 
So that's additive. There's subtractive synthesis, which is the most commonly used synthesis, where you have a, a waveform that can either be pure like a sine wave or harmonically rich like some of the other waves we'll talk about, and you use things called filters to shape the amount of overtones and change the timbre, and I'll be showing you that in a second. So synthesizer waveform types. You get sine wave, triangle, sawtooth, and pulse or square. Uh, there's a reason for pulse. Uh, let's just call it square wave for now. Those are the four most commonly used synthesizer waveforms. There's also something called FM synthesis, which uses sine waves as well, but that's, uh, that's diff different, much different. So sine waves represent the pure tone of a single frequency, which is called the fundamental. The other waveforms have added harmonics or overtones that take place above the fundamental. This can add brightness, complexity, and texture to the sound. So sine waves have a single frequency, the fundamental tone, with allegedly no overtones above it. The other waveforms have added harmonics or overtones that take place above the fundamental, and this can add brightness, complexity, and texture to the sound. And you can change the, the volume of those harmonics, which will change the timbre. So if we were to look, and we've seen this already, this is one cycle of a sine wave, right? We've seen this already. Now, two other ones, triangle waves and square waves, both contain only odd harmonics, but their amplitude decreases with different rates. Each successive harmonic in a square wave is a third as low in amplitude or a third as soft, and then for every... Um, harmonic in a triangle wave, it's a tenth as quiet. So this is what a triangle wave looks like. That's the representation. It looks like a triangle. And this is what a square wave looks like. Now, if you see something like this where it goes up here, goes down here, and then, you know, does the same thing, the width of this is the, is, you know, they can change this and it's called pulse wave because you're changing the width of the square. You're making it more of a rectangle than a square, but that's a more advanced. Sawtooth waves, sawtooth waves are the most harmonically rich because they have harmonics every integer above the fundamental, so all the harmonics, and it looks like a sawtooth. Okay, so this is a tiny little synthesizer that I've got here, and this is called um, the Artoria Micro Brute, and it's inexpensive, but it has a very good sound, and it fits on my tabletop, so it's easy for me to... Let me just reposition the mic a little bit. Here we go. All right. So you'll notice here that there's a keyboard, right? And I'm playing the keyboard, but there's no sound. And that's because we have right here... This plays one note at a time. It's got a single oscillator, but each one of these oscillators has three. This oscillator has three waveforms, right? You can see tri a, a sawtooth right here. Let me get above this instead of, uh, and let me get a pointing device. Let's see. Uh, well, you can see sawtooth, square, and triangle. This is the volume of each one of these waveforms. So if I play a note and I bring up the, this one here, it's triangle, it's going to be a very smooth sound. Oh, I have to turn the volume up here too. Okay. Very smooth, right? So that's a triangle wave. Right? Very smooth. I could take that down, and then I can bring up the square wave, and this will be a little bit buzzier because it's got uh, the overtones above it are a little bit louder than the overtones present on the triangle wave. I don't have a, a, uh, um, a sine wave here. I have it in Pro Tools, which I'll show you shortly. 
So more, it's buzzier. Now, let me show you something here. Let me turn this down and let me, I'm going to change the octave here and make it very low pitch, right? So if I bring up the triangle, now I'm going to put this at uh, full volume, right? Hear how loud that is? Now I'm going to bring up the square wave and it's going to seem like it's louder. I'm going to show you that it's not really louder later on. But because the overtones are louder here, it cuts through a lot better. So this is, you know, this is something to think about when you're an instrumentalist, right? If you're playing live, your tone will help to dictate if you cut through a mix or not. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept, right? Something, it can be the same volume, and I'll show it to you on a meter later, but it can appear to be louder because of the number of harmonics that are present, and that will help cut through a mix more. So, you know, if you're playing a, 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 an, a reed instrument or a trumpet or something like that, you could change your timbre in a, instead of trying to play louder, trying changing your timbre and seeing if that will cut through the mix more, right? Because it's got more presence, more harmonics are present. Just an interesting thought. All right, so I'm going to now do this sawtooth wave, and that's going to be the buzziest. Now, I can combine waveforms, right? So if I add a square wave to that... I can add some of the triangle wave. That's much more complex. And then I can use these here to do more, uh, more make them change the timbre a little bit more of all of them. Right. But let's just go back to our uh, sawtooth and let's get everything back to zero. This right here is a cutoff filter. And I've got it set for low pass, which means that as I adjust it, it will attenuate louder pitches, loud, higher frequencies, and allow low frequencies to pass through. So low pass. It allows low frequencies to pass through. Right? So that it's, it's off right now, and I'm, I'm gonna, or it's open, and I'm going to close it. And you hear I'm cutting off the overtones. Right? Now, that's a sawtooth wave, and I've adjusted this, and it sounds very similar to, much more closer to this than to this. And that becomes more apparent with a Right, with a, with a square wave and a triangle wave are more related to each other. So now, the other thing you can do is, if I turn our, our, our sawtooth back up. So if I bring the cutoff filter down, this knob here is called resonance. And what this does is it will emphasize the frequencies that are f found right at the cutoff point. So as I bring this to the left, it's changing the cutoff point. And I'll show you this in Pro Tools later. If I turn the resonance up, you're gonna hear like a wowish. And you can, you can hear, if, I don't know how well this will go up through Zoom, but you can hear So let me crank the resonance all the way up. And you can hear different pitches, right? Ba 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 bum. All right. 
So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna use this again in a minute, but let's uh, let me just turn everything off here so it doesn't go through. All right, let's uh, move my mic back here, and let's go back to Pro Tools. Okay. Um, All right, so this is a sine wave. I, I told you that I would uh, do sine waves, right? And, and you can see that it looks just like, I can make it bigger using the zoom tool, right? And you can see that it's very regular. Now, this is at 20 hertz. And what that means is that in one second of time, you will have 20 complete cycles, right? So in other words, I've got this set to, my grid set to one second. If I go from here to here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I have to do this this way. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So there are 20 of those in one second. Okay. Let's get this closed. We don't need to have that open. So that's that pitch. You're, I'm going to play this now. You're not going to be able to hear it. It's so quiet. Now, Let's go, let's move over to here. And you'll see that this is the same pitch, this is the same volume, but 40 hertz. So that means it's twice as fast. So that means in one second, there are 40 of these. And you could see that the period from the, you know, the peak to the peak is twice as, it comes out twice as, twice as many. Right. So now you still can't hear that. That's pretty low. If I turn the volume up here, I can sort of hear it a little bit. But here at 80 hertz, which is twice the pitch of that. Let's do this. Give me one second. Yeah, that 40 hertz is really pushing out some low air. You, you're not going to be able to hear it. You should be able to hear that at 80. And now at 160, 320. So it's just going up an octave. So let's look at 1280 here, and we'll see how many oscillations there are. Right? You could see how, how f it, you know, it almost looks like a solid block when you zoom out. Now, that's at minus 40 decibels. So that's really quiet. I had to boost it by 24 just to hear it. This right here is at minus 20. So you could see that the height is much greater. Right, hold on a sec. Let me just, let's do this. Let's get everything to be the same height. So that, that this means that this is louder than this. And you'll notice it's not twice as loud. It's, a, it's, it's logarithmic. It's exponentially louder. So you still can't hear that at 20. Right? So here's uh, minus 20 dB. I can hear... Right? So this is minus 20 right here. This is minus 40 without the additional volume much softer, barely audible on my system here. And then at minus 5 dB, much louder, right? So you could see it's not just a little bit louder, it's, diff it's different. And we can, 
that at minus five, you can really start hearing. And this is really pushing some low air. Now, let's see, clear. Let's do this. Let me just play at 320. So this is a frequency graph, right? From left to right is low pitch to high pitch, and from bottom to top is soft to loud. So that's 320. Uh, right, so you could see there's a peak here, right at 320, and then it, like I said, it's very hard to get pure sine waves. This should just really come right down like this, but there are some additional overtones here. But see, as you you could see as it's playing there. Let's do this uh, 1280. It seems to be longer. Right, you could see it's there, and there's just very tiny additional overtones there. So, what we'll do next is all right, so I'm playing my synthesizer now. I have to record sound. Let me do this. For some reason, it's not playing out properly. So let's do this. So I'm playing an A right now. And I'm using the sawtooth. All right. And let's zoom in. And you see it looks just like a sawtooth, right? Like we saw in the uh, in the image. And let's take a look here. Let's clear this. And you could see that, look at the, all up here. These are all, every one of these little things is a pitch, right? There's a pitch here, a pitch here, a pitch here. Here, here, here. All these are overtones. That's all, you know, odd and even overtones right all the way through. And that's what makes it so buzzy. Let's do this next. Over here. And let's record. And now I'll do the square wave. We turn that volume up. Let's do that again. And let's zoom in on that. All right, and you could see that it's not a perfect square. None of them are, right? Very rarely do you see it, but you, you could see that it's square-ish, right? So let's take a look at our frequency, and let's clear this, and... And you could see that there are less overtones right above it, and they're just very distinct peaks here. All right, and let's move here. And let's now do our triangle wave. Whoop, I turned that way up too much, hold on. One more time. There we go. Whoops, and you could see they look like little triangles or hats, <laughs> right? And so this is one cycle from here to here. 
or from here to here. That's the classical definition. For me, it's easier to see that. And let's take a look at our frequency. We'll clear this. Let's clear it again. Now, it looks very similar to the square, except that the volume of these are lower. So in other words, on the square wave, these additional few overtones here were like up in this area here, right? So let me show you that one after the other. Hold on. Here we go. So this is our square wave. All right, so see the volume of these? This is above the minus 40 line, two of them, and one is right at the minus 40 line. Let me clear that and let me play the triangle. And you could see they're nowhere, the same pitches, but nowhere near the minus 40 line. So that's why this sounds less buzzy, because these harmonics are softer. Same harmonics, just softer. Now, the next thing we'll do is we'll start off I'm going, to st I'm, going to, I'm going to start recording stuff, and I'm going to start playing around with the synthesizer controls. Not going to change pitch, and we'll see how the um, waveform changes, all right? And we'll, let me clear this, and we might as well look at this while I'm playing it. Oh, that's not, right, because of the, something weird is happening with Pro Tools, it's not seeing that. Actually, I could do, mm. Let me undo that. All right, so uh, let's, let's try that again. So I did all sorts of crazy stuff there, just to that one A. And let's make this a little smaller. And look at how the complexity of the waveform. Right? You see that? Very complex. Let's go right here. Right? And you can see that it's just, it's very complex. But this is the way we look at it. See these? And I wasn't changing the volume. I was just adding additional overtones and distorting the sound a little bit. So let's take a look at our frequency meter here, and we'll see how it changes over time. See the higher overtones coming out? They're um, getting to be close to as loud as the fundamental. Now the fundamental is widening. Change the filter. Resonance. Look at that dance. Those are cycling through the harmonics. Crazy, right? 
Um, that's all the same pitch, A. It's like, you know, uh, how would you orchestrate something like that with acoustic instruments? But you can see how uh, uh, this is just like an introduction to waveforms and overtone, you know, how overtones can change, the volume of overtones above a fundamental can change the timbre of a sound.